All right, welcome back, everybody. Our next and final speaker needs no introduction, but I'm paid per introduction, so he gets one anyway. Juan Benet is the founder of Protocol Labs, the research, development, and deployment uh, lab which developed IPFS and Filecoin. He's committed to building a better future using science and technology, and today he's going to round out Crypto Economics Day, Filecoin Crypto Economics Day, with a talk about solving large scale problems with Filecoin. Hey, everyone. Uh, great to be here with you. Uh, awesome day uh, uh, today. So, what I want to talk about is how we can use uh, crypto econ and Filecoin to solve massive scale problems. Uh, over the last, certainly over the last 10 years, it was already getting this sense, but I think really accelerated over the last three to four years. Um, I've come to see the, uh, the stuff that's happening with Web3 in terms of incentive design and mechanism design as the largest levers that humanity has right now to um, fix massive scale problems uh, because they enable the, this kind of incremental um, growth of some solution in, in a way that other microsystems have not quite enabled. Uh, really awesome day to uh, and great to dive into the depths of Pato and Crypto Econ. Uh, this is going to be this last talk is going to um, go more broadly into thinking about um, how we can use these crypto econ principles to uh, shift large scale um, other large scale systems and how we can use the facilities of Falcon itself to um, do that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, I gave a talk yesterday at Shelling Point called "Achieving Paradoxopia with Crypto Economics." which is kind of a prerequisite. So if you are in there, uh, bummer. However, uh, no, no, I'll summarize it for you. Uh, the basic idea, the basic summary of the talk is, is there on the right, which is if regen, whack me, else, and GMI. Uh, the point is, if we can create regenerative crypto economics, we're all going to make it and we're going to advert disaster. Otherwise, we're not. Um, this, has been a, this is an extremely critical century. So there's been this amazing uh, range of global improvement uh, throughout history. We are confronted with uh, certain existential risks uh, where we now have both the ability to wipe out ourselves and all of life, um, probably not all of life, but most of life, um, and we might screw up this massive computing phase transition um, that's happening. Uh, and unfortunately, right now, our macro systems are um, inadequate, though they've been uh, excellent to get us through the last few centuries of global improvement, um, maybe debatable whether excellent is the right word, but really good. Uh, we've just had this unprecedented amount of global improvement. Um, however, uh, we're headed into these kinds of problems that uh, those government systems are not quite equipped to, to solve. Um, now, what we want to get to is kind of this credit utopian outlook where we can use mechanism design to get everyone to be thinking in massive positive sum um, ways, where you're not thinking through small resource increases, but you're thinking of order of magnitude level increases. And you're getting people to stop um, negative competition um, and engage in collaborative competition, or just straight up collaboration. Um, ideally, you want to create an environment where the incentive, you use incentive structures to warp the actions that, that various different groups might take, so that you align them towards this, this collaboration and you can get to uh, the Paradotopian outlook. Um, Paradotopia is, is this, this conception that once you kind of realize that the future is so much, so amazingly positive sum, if you can get there, um, then it sort of makes sense for everyone to sort of band together, um, align on that cooperation to do the science and technology um, diffusion that we need to get to that, that um, uh, fantastic future. So think of crypto economics as this like tool that we can use to kind of reshape the landscape, whether it's by kind of like um, it boring through the whole, it, creating a new, a, a new, a new uh, uh, hole through like this incentive field to try and get to like a better um, optimum, or by like moving mountains in that landscape itself, um, you can use mechanisms and drop them into the network uh, to achieve this kind of, this kind of thing. <clears throat> Just to give you a sense of, um, I, th I think everybody here is already paged in into how powerful mechanism design is, but um, it's just every year I need to kind of like um, step back and, and, and remind myself that Web3 is really programmable. Um, the, the, the tooling that Web3 gives us enables us to 
really sh reshape any kind of coordination structure. And that's extremely fundamental. It's, it's eating um, law, it's eating finance, it's eating all kinds of uh, structures. And so we're going to be seeing over the next five to 10 years uh, and beyond um, this kind of mechanism design rippling through major parts of the economy and uh, major parts of governments and so on. So it's an extremely like powerful lever. Um, let's make sure that we use it for like really good things. Uh, so for example, in um, the, the Bitcoin hash rate has been incredibly illustrative to me over the years in showing just how powerful of a lever this uh, mechanism design is. One uh, straightforward incentive structure both enabled the world to um, get into the world of cryptocurrencies and, and actually enabled the cryptocurrency to, um, to grow, to compete with fiat currencies. But it also, that same incentive structure also created the, you know, a massive run of equilibrium that just wastes an enormous amount of, amount of energy. Um, and like, you know, there's in, this taken what, like 12, um, 12 years or so? It's in 12 years, we went from like, you know, a network that didn't do anything to now one of the largest energy consum consuming things on the planet. Um, which is wild. And, and that's kind of like, without the massive, that's also having to bust through the walls of getting people to accept your cryptocurrencies and get into that idea and re forming the entire Web3 movement in its wake. Um, now that the Web3 movement is here, you could, do, you could redo something like this in probably two to five years. Um, with Falcon, we've gotten a, a taste of just how powerful these incentive structures are by creating an open and permissionless network. In a year and a half, we've assembled 15, 16 exabytes of capacity. Like that's an, an insane amount of storage. Um, so that should give you a sense of like just how powerful these levers are. Uh, now you have to like designing design it really carefully, and like it's great that we are having this day to like talk about the the nitty gritty details of these structures. Um, but you know, like the main takeaway here is like the more you can think in that kind of scale, the more you can make open and permissionless networks, and you get the you, you design the incentive structures carefully to achieve good results, uh, the better it will be. And also be careful, like to take the Bitcoin story as like a warning sign of like um, the the incentive structures you make <laughs> once they like grow in ma to massive scales might have a bunch of unintended consequences. And so, um, you know, think through that. Um, now, I think that we can use all of this incentive structure mechanism design to accelerate the science and technology translation process itself. Um, uh, a lot of us here in this room and, and in this community are working towards these goals by um, thinking through the, the, all of these processes, thinking about um, how to enable funding to uh, come to all kinds of efforts and groups uh, that are doing work in science, doing work in, in technology building. Um, we're creating new incentive structures to do that technology translation. We're participating in the public goods ecosystem. We're creating events to enable a lot of people to hear about these ideas, uh, present some of their projects, and so on. And we're kind of uh, trying to create a, a dramatically better um, kind of funding scale uh, staircase for all these public goods uh, type processes. So it's a lot of work going on in here, but um, uh, but I think it's it's been like you know. A lot of people have been talking about this, and um, you know, events like Shelling Point and Funding the Commons and others um, are really great for, uh, for that conversation. Um, I'm going to give a different example today, which is looking at the Falcon Green project. Uh, I think this is a great example of using um, mechanism design as this massive lever, um, breaking down a massive scale problem into, like, you know, the pitch of this talk is planetary scale problems, right? So, how do we break a massive planetary scale problem into smaller bits? Um, and the Falcon Green Project is a great example of, of doing this. So the, I'll tell you a little bit about Falcon Green first and then tell you how to go from like a smaller problem to a larger scale problem. Uh, Falcon Green is a project to decarbonize Falcoin uh, and in so doing, um, figure out systems by which to decarbonize the rest of crypto and the rest of the computing infrastructure and potentially other infrastructure. So we start small. We, start, we, we, we don't try to tackle the whole thing. We, we try to tackle something much smaller. Uh, let's think of just the Falcon network and the energy use within the Falcon network. Let's measure it. Let's figure out um, verifiable structures for identifying like where where the energy is going, what kind of energy is it, uh, and then let's use financial instruments uh, and structures to offset all of that energy use. Uh, and ideally, let's try and start applying pressure into the hardware manufacturers to um, produce better, greener hardware. So um, that's a stuff that maybe will come later. That um, I don't think there's a ton of progress on this yet, but be really awesome to start shifting those incentives. One of the, the key things here is to take a large problem, break it down into something that you think will scale well, uh, that's achievable in the shorter term. If you try to tackle something way too big that you just can't make progress on, you'll, you might spend 
many months to years chipping away the problem and you won't achieve that growth. By grabbing something smaller that works good enough, that isn't perfect, but is good enough to show people that it can, um, uh, that it can scale and is already kind of directionally correct, um, you, you kick off a movement and you ki kick off this broader um, range of improvement that can happen. So um, the, how this project works is that you know, it's building a bunch of different sub-projects and sub-tools that are meant to kind of uh, work together. It's not like a big monolithic thing. It's kind of a mod modular ecosystem-oriented approach uh, to making this kind of change. It's building dashboards that track the energy use and estimate it. So it doesn't have a perfect estimate. It's not, it doesn't matter. It creates a lower bound. It creates an upper bound. It has some, some estimate. Then using that estimate, we can then go around and buy RECs. Um, RECs are renewable energy uh, credits which enable you to, to, one of the really cool things about RECs and, and why they might be better than many other um, carbon offset type things is that, in, that they enable you to show precisely where the energy is coming from, in which grid, from which producer, at which time of day, and what kind of plant it is. So that lets you, uh, in a in an, um, verifiable way, get a sense of precisely what type of energy is being put into the grid precisely at the time that you're pulling it out, out of the grid. And so that there you can, have a, a strong claim that the energy you're pulling out of the grid is precisely the energy you're buying um, that when you're putting in, which gets rid of a bunch of the nasty problems around carbon credits. So carbon credits is a great idea, um, phenomenal idea to use the financial system to carbonize the planet. Uh, however, if you don't, you know, if you create a bunch of loopholes, um, you can end up with a bunch of unintended consequences. There's been a bunch of stories of that in the past. So renewable energy credits kind of solve that problem, solve a set of problems there of like trying to introduce way more verifiability into the picture. Uh, I would expect this kind of thing to be scaled, like get to the point where you have machines in the plants themselves that, that are able to run some zero knowledge computation um, or, or that have like tamper proof hardware or stuff like that, where you know precisely that like, you know, somebody's not messing, messing with, the, uh, with the estimates and so on. But we gotta start somewhere and we gotta create the incentive structures for the whole system to get better towards that by creating significant rewards um, for this kind of work, um, people will, progressively get better, um, we'll get better and better and better at, at doing these kinds of things. So the Falcon project, um, Falcon Green project, um, in addition is like um, enabling a lot of other groups to, and, and people to get involved. It's, it's enabling individuals to, who have other ideas uh, or, or new ideas or want to pursue some of the ideas that the project has had um, to go try them out. And this might be through like different kind of grant systems. Um, there's like a bunch of different grants that, um, that, that the project is sort of um, connected to. Um, and it's building a whole set of collaborations with a bunch of other groups to kind of um, follow the path of least, least resistance towards um, greater and greater um, uh, impact. It's also enabling a lot of people, individuals, that like, are interested in the project or interested in the ideas to actually get involved. And this is a, a crucial thing um, that I think I see tons of projects forget. Um, if you create good avenues by which individuals that are interested in helping you, um, where they can follow, um, the, the information, where they can uh, participate, where they can uh, learn about what you're doing, uh, you can turn something that might be like a small project for a small group of people into a massive movement that a lot of people are gonna, um, gonna work on. And so things like meetups end up being really important, uh, creating a, a, the Sustainable Blockchain Summit. You know that it's not the Sustainable Falcon Summit. Creating a Sustainable Blockchain Summit creates the, the opening to get a bunch of other crypto groups to show up and also uh, talk about their projects to decarbonize their um, chains and how to use that stuff to decarbonize the planet. Um, and so by, by creating kind of like all these like smaller level levers that align incentives with other groups, uh, you start kind of like tackling this larger, larger problem. Uh, by the way, fantastic talks from that summit and can't wait for the, for the next one. Uh, there's a bunch of like really, really good stuff there. Um, and you know, it, like good call to like, you can follow and participate directly asynchronously in, in the network. So that's kind of like the, 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 the technology behind Falcon Green involves um, looking at the actual physical machines that are running the Falcon network, estimating the power consumption, and then getting, leaning into the verifiable claims stack that rec the renewable energy credits community has built, and gluing this, these two things together, building a market where you can precisely buy um, uh, RECs for precisely where the SPs are purchasing energy. And so it's connecting a lot of things together and enabling the thing to work uh, fully but, and kicking off an incentive structure for the whole network. Um, now then the kind of the whole social incentive structure part of this is, you know, you, you're using kind of news and grants and um, event forming and so on 
to catalyze a larger scale action in, in the community. So it's both like incentives directly in the network and the, for the people that are running the network and incentives for the broader community to actually have an impact in the, in the broader thing. Uh, now, so let's scale that up. So, so if we get to decarbonize Falcon and we can um, solve that as a problem, we can then start scaling it up. We can work with other chains that are doing the same thing. We can um, talk to other chains about the, how, how to approach this problem. We can give them a bunch of the technology. We can encourage them or incentivize them to do this by saying, hey, look, our chain is way better. It's way, uh, not, only, um, not only can we get to carbon neutral, we can get to carbon negative. Um, one of the things that I want to get to is like, be able to say that uh, you know, Falcoin is like, I don't know, 5x or 10x uh, carbon negative in an area so that whenever Falcoin is there, uh, it is actually like pulling carbon from the atmosphere uh, around itself for that nation or something like that. Like that. I think that would be pretty, pretty awesome. Um, and if we can do that, then we can incentivize a bunch of other groups in the blockchain space to do that. And then if suddenly all of crypto itself is doing this and we, uh, you know, get rid of this like mistake in, in our past of like having produced the, uh, uh, the big, big massive energy waste that Bitcoin is, and we can not only offset all of the other chains, but also Bitcoin and we make all of crypto, not only carbon neutral, but, but massively carbon negative, then at that point, the whole world is going to start paying attention, uh, paying attention and suddenly other industries, entire other industries, industries will be incentivized very strongly to catch up to the crypto space. Uh, once you get a bunch of other industries incentivized to catch up with the crypto space, you can then finally get to a point where large, enormous large groups um, are getting to be carbon negative and we can kind of unwind this like crazy um, uh, set of emissions uh, back down. So I think like all of this is you start with like massive scale problem, break it down into smaller groups, and find ways everywhere along the way, from the small scales to the medium scales to the large scales, of creating incentives by which like, you cost coordination, you lean into comp competition, so collaborative competition, you wanna get the different crypto communities to be competing with each other of like who's the greenest blockchain, um, because that's what's gonna get crypto itself to be very green. And then once crypto itself is green, then we can compete with our, the other industries about which industry is the greenest. And so you, you, you wanna use these kinds of like highly collaborative, competitive, um, open environments at every stack. Um, so, so that's kind of like an approach to, to solving a large scale um, planetary problem. Now, of course, like there's an enormous amount of work in getting this done. There's all kinds of systems to, that we need to improve, all kinds of systems that we need to design and build and, and, um, um, and so on. Uh, all kinds of processes that, that we need to kind of like refine, make verifiable and so on. This is an area where all kinds of tech is going to um, from the crypto space, from a, now in a different angle, all kinds of other really amazing improvements in the crypto space can help this kind of computation. So all the zero knowledge proof stuff, all the verifiable computation stuff is phenomenal for this kind of thing. This is um, this kind of problem and many other problems in the world um, have a, a kind of crisis of incentives and trust where you want certain parties to take certain actions, but ideally you want to not have to trust them. You ideally want to be able to um, provide a verifiable verifiability layer to what's going on so that you can trust the entire process and the entire system. I think like all of the, the zero knowledge proof proof type of stuff can be can come into all kinds of um, facets of, of broader industry and broader world activity to um, improve how those those systems work and enable you to create financialized structures that actually work. Um, one of the big kind of points of contention that the broader mainstream world has on financializing the, the solution of problems is that it's very easy to kind of warp the incentives and end up with all kinds of unintended consequences, um, or just like um, like bullshit claims outright, where like parties are lying about the, the the stuff that they're doing. But that's where verifiability is really important. Be able to create um, verifiable structures that um, you know keep removing sources of of potential problems. So I think like all the um, cryptography, deep cryptography work that is going on in zero knowledge proofs. It's going to be like a very large lever at solving a bunch of these problems because you can take those kind of verifiable claim type structures, weave them into these larger industries, um, and then kind of, um, then at that point, really financialize them and scale them in, in, in massive scales. Uh, one thing that's going to help here, and I don't have a slide for this, is, is certificates of impact are going to, I think, I play, and there's other talks about, it, about these. I, I do think that once we have these verifiable claim structures, um, certificates of impact present a way to financialize almost anything. Um, which is an extremely, extremely powerful primitive. So we'll see a lot of that stuff uh, coming, on, coming out over time. Uh, one other thing I want to I reflect on is uh, the Falcon Plus incentive structure 
is is really really useful. It it gives us a way to um, uh, incentivize the gathering, collection, uh, like um, assembling, cleaning up of, and making use of, use usable. Um, it, yeah, it enables us to, to to identify a bunch of data sets that we can collect, gather, improve, um, and refine, and so on, and make usable. Uh, and so we should be using these incentive structures to go after massive scale problems. So, for example. Um, Think of massive scale data sets that could be really impactful in certain problems that are really big and really expensive and, and really hard to deal with, or that are really far away from being able to make verifiable or um, are very disconnected from, from the economy. You, you can start doing things like um, think through uh, some really important data set that you think is going to enable um, some kind of financialized um, uh, way to solve some major problem in the world and say, OK, great, Like, what's the data that we need? So that we can get a bunch of speculators to speculate on the on the prediction market about what's going to happen. So, for example, uh, let me I'll go to this first, and I'll return. Uh, think of like being able to make claims about the planet. Uh, so there are data sets like Landsat. Right now, Landsat is not really connected to um, uh, the crypto economy. I think I don't know if hedge funds trade on this, uh, but I'm sure they trade on all kinds of uh, activity that is totally viewable through Landsat. So if you had like a real time um, connectivity to uh, exactly what's happening on the planet, and you had blockchains being able to act on that data right away, and you had like massive scale bets going on on precisely what what what's going on, and you had a verifiable way to, to look at it, um, then you can you can start making making certain kinds of um, uh, trades possible, and at that point you can you can then start warping the incentive field to achieve the outcomes that you want. Uh, so this might be ways of like holding groups accountable for certain uh, actions, or this might be ways of like responding to certain problems, or it might be ways of like settling important forecasts and predictions, right? So um, the uh, crypto world has, um, not just the crypto world, but um, a lot of groups have pointed out that forecasting um, of massive scale problems could be greatly helped by prediction markets. Unfortunately, prediction markets aren't quite allowed in a bunch of, bunch of places. That's a bummer. In the crypto space, um, uh, there's going to be a lot, I'm guessing there's going to be way more use of prediction markets. And so hopefully we might end up with like um, prediction market DAO things that are able to uh, take um, significant bets about cases like this so that we can understand what's going to, what's going, what certain actions are going to uh, do in certain regions. So you can then at that point get a lot more information about certain kinds of problems. Pr prediction markets are an extremely useful structure because they let you... Um, build a lot of trust in specific actors that get extremely good at um, predicting the future so that you know ahead of time how much you should trust certain kinds of uh, uh, possibilities and proposals and so on. So all of this kind of data, Landsat is pretty big, especially if you want to get like higher um, uh, resolution imagery or you want to get not just like visual imagery, but you want to get all kinds of other kind of data about the world, but you know, once you... Um, there are these massive scale data sets about um, uh, certain, like the actual ground, for example, like massive man mining companies have to generate like these insanely complex, um, huge data sets about um, all of the you know, telemetry data they're gathering in certain regions. All of that data you could um, bring into Filecoin. You can use the Filecoin Plus incentive to just cause all these groups to gather that data. You can then, once you have the data, connect it to smart contracts and, and then financialize it, which is it. Super, super, super interesting. Now, the stuff that um, is going to enable a lot of that, that stuff is, uh, I'll say it for the 50th time today, the FEM. The FEM is going to enable that kind of layer uh, to emerge. Because kind of like what, what we've been missing is the, is the, is the hook um, where we can start uh, creating computational networks around Falcon, right? So Falcon right now doesn't have smart contracts. Once, once it does, you can create schedulers and then start doing data pipelines around all of this data. So the, the missing piece is like, um, so you can bring all that data into, into Falcon. Now you want to connect it to a smart contract, and you need the ability to run arbitrary code in ideally a verifiable computing sort of way. Um, and so like that's, that's a, things that are, gonna, that are gonna happen over the next six to 12 months is building out all of these kinds of um, computational networks. So things like, and when you think about like um, Falcon storage providers, they have these massive scale deployments, and they already have a bunch of GPUs. That's precisely what you need to build, to build a massive computational network. That can operate over this whole data, and that can run all the all the expensive proofs uh, for this kind of information. So, um, the, this kind of thing of like taking a data set like Landsat 
and thinking about a certain kind of action that you want to incentivize um, and building all the incentive structures around it um, needs these like two missing pieces. One is like the smart contract layer, and then after that, like the ability to run verifiable computation over that data set. And that's coming really fast. That's you know, going to be here in the next uh, six to 12 months. And at that point, you, you can do, you can put all these pieces together and get that kind of, um, that kind of action. So this is one example data set. There's probably hundreds of these kinds of example data sets. So we, we're, getting, we're building these massive levers to like move mountains and move the world. Um, there's all kinds of uh, different kinds of use cases that, that, could, um, that we could lean on. Uh, probably should have some conference about this. Like what kind of large scale problem is connected some, like, to some massive data set where gaining the ability to financialize that uh, would produce you know, some major positive impact in, in the world. So maybe like a to-do for the future, like maybe another crypto econ day could focus on what massive scale problems can we solve with crypto econ. Um, great, so I think probably the last thing I'll mention here um, is that at the end of the day, like the, the, the tools that we're building um, will only be successful if we can get them into, mar into the market and used by lar large groups of people. So that means, again, taking, breaking down a massive scale problem into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces, starting with that, with that uh, construction, creating an incentive structure that enables a lot of other parties to come in and contribute. Um, you want to use collaborative competition because that's a very useful structure to um, cause many other groups to, um, to go as fast as possible towards some goal. Uh, you want to, again, be very careful about the incentive structure you design, because if you screw it up, um, then you, you, know, you get the Bitcoin proof of work waste. Uh, but if you can do that from smaller to larger to larger and larger and larger structures, then you can truly move mountains and you can fix the planet. Uh, great, thanks. And um, I don't know if there's time for questions, but uh, I think it, the time's up, so I'll stop here. Thanks, Juan. After a talk like that, there's always time for questions. Questions to the speaker. I'm going to go back. Yeah, I think the question I have is who designs these incentive systems? And you know, that centralizes the power in, in one way in their hands. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I think, I think blockchain networks are vastly more um, more open about this than like you, you can propose a design sh change to a blockchain in a way that you can't to a financial um, you, you can submit a FIP you can submit an EIP you can't do that to the US government <laughs> or to um, the IMF and so on right which is kind of like wild um, so I think um, I think there's all kinds of structures that can and should be improved across all these systems to get to a better spot I think CryptoEcon in particular, um, there's like all this complexity. Because you're designing incentive structures, there's all kinds of groups that will um, uh, benefit or lose from certain mechanisms. So it very quickly gets heavily politicized and problematic. Um, but if you can kind of like remove that as much as possible, or get to a spot where like um, there's common knowledge that certain things are really useful broadly for the network and align with a long term long term mission, then you can build significant agreement in those networks to get that kind of change happening. A good example of this is the, the Ethereum community is just filled with moments like this that it had to kind of uh, break through and it shifted its own economic structures. Sometimes, um, you know, like the, the move off of proof of work into proof of stake is like a massive one that they've been doing for years. And it's, it's a huge economic shift, but the community had enough interest in that to cause that kind of shift. Um, but, you know, the, these blockchain networks are dramatically easier to, to change in this way. There's probably like a, like a from in a machine learning way, a, a hyperparameter optimization thing that we could do here, which is like, how do you create, um, how do you create way more crypto connectivity happening? And you kind of create a much more robust study of all these systems. Um, I think right now, we know this in the Falcon community, like the, the level of rigor that we bring to crypto econ is way higher than many other, many other groups. And even when you integrate, put all of that together, across the, be the best groups and, and, and all of them, um, that is probably way lower than what we want. We ideally want something 10 to 100 to 1,000 X better than whatever we have going on. Um, and so finding ways of doing that might be, might be really good. Um, potentially might be like causing there to be 10 to 100,000 more 
uh, ten to hundred x more people uh, going into studying crypto econ. Um, we might uh, start with a crypto econ textbook. I heard that said before. Uh, I think uh, uh, David in, our, in um, who helped design a lot of the Falcon crypto econ, I think said in the past like, oh wow, this is like super powerful. Um, it took me a while to learn this. It'd be great if somebody wrote a crypto econ textbook so that a lot of people could like uh, have a much faster path at understanding the, the what you need inter for the mechanism design. Um, because you have to learn a lot. You have to learn a bunch of game theory. You have to learn a lot of um, uh, distributed systems. You have to learn a lot of uh, cryptography and so on. And you end up in like pulling pieces from a bunch of things that um, to actually get to get to CryptoEcon. So there's like a good high lever high leverage thing for somebody somebody to do. One more. I feel like what right. I've had a lot of conversations this week about privacy and anonymity. I think there's a lot of people that value maximizing that in the Web3 ecosystem. And yet we're looking at like uh, planetary surveillance maximization as well. Like, do you ever f wonder if, or do you, yeah, what, is your, what are your thoughts on uh, anonymity, privacy, maximization potentially being anti-progressive in the context of, of what you're talking? Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's a huge problem. Um, and it's very complicated. Um, so maybe like in the, in the most succinct way, I would say that there's, we're an integrated system. Like the, the idea that there are individuals and groups and so on is like um, useful fictions for us to like operate. But at the end of the day, you have like this massive integrated system. Um, you know, when you go down to uh, atoms and so on, uh, and so you end up in a situation where, at very various layers of the stack, you want to have a different part of that solution. For example, at a planetary scale, it's pretty important for the whole planet, planetary community. To be able to understand what the, what's going on with the planet, um, you know what nuclear tests are happening, what emissions are happening, and so on, uh, what oil spills are happening, what trash is being uh, uh, spilled into the ocean or picked up or whatever, um, and maybe even at the range of a city, you might want to understand what kind of like problems are happening in certain streets or whatever. Like think of um, Europe is filled with like CCTV all over the place. Like uh, walking around Amsterdam, you can see all the cameras. I'm sure that they reduce crime. Um, I'm sure they also violate privacy. I'm sure that they also create the conditions by which you can do digital, digitally totalitarian things. And like that's terrifying. Um, so it's a really hard trade-off. Um, I think the where I sort of land on this is the more you can create, you, you can agree on the policies and the preferences and what is a good mission. And the more you can kind of enforce the technology to follow that and only that and limit the, the scope of potential misuse, um, the better off you are. And so that means leaning into um, verifiable computation, leaning into homomorphic encryption, leaning into all of those kinds of kind of privacy preserving techniques that still allow you to, as a group, compute on something together. It doesn't. You don't have to have access to the CCTV camera things. You can have ML um, algorithms figure out like, oh yeah, this is a probable problem, and then at that point decrypt. Um, so that's like a like an example kind of use case. But I think this is a a deeply hard question that is going to have very different answers at different layers of the stack, at different points in time, and in different societies. And it's extremely hard to predict what's going to yield a better outcome because it's highly dynamic. The world changes a lot and changes really fast. And so today we have a lot of peace and, and, and prosperity globally relative to many points in the past. But that could change. And if it changes, then we might feel very differently about a bunch of these structures. So. I think we're running out of time now, so if you'd like to ask any more questions, you may get to um, do that at the social hour after, after this meeting. I'd like to thank Juan one more time for allowing us to end on a very high note at planetary scale and give another shout out to all of our presenters today and for you, the audience, for your questions and your thoughtful attention. I hope we've convinced you that Filecoin crypto, crypto Economics is a really fun sandbox to play in a really cool and very powerful system to explore some very deep questions, and that maybe we've attracted you to come play with some of our toys. And now we'd like to invite you to socialize a bit and to chat about some of the topics we discussed today below in the atrium level at the social hour. Thanks again to all the presenters, and cheers.